Laura passed her Texas SPED exam on the first try. How? She used the 240 study guide. Congratulations, Laura! After I saw that testimonial, I knew we had to make a video for the Texas Special Education EC-12 exam to help other people just like Laura pass their test. My name is Emma, and I've worked with many students throughout my eight years as a teacher, including those with special needs. Now, I help teachers pass their certification exams at 240. And today, I'm gonna help you. This video is going to prepare you for the Texas Special Education EC-12 test, also known as Texas 161. This is the test you'll take if you want to teach special education in elementary, middle, or high school in Texas. And this video is going to cover three things. What's on the test and how to study for it. The most likely concepts you'll need to know. And we're going to look at a few practice questions. Can I get a heck yeah from everybody who's ready to rock? Heck yeah! Thanks, studio guys. Now, the Texas 161 exam is broken into four domains understanding individuals with disabilities and evaluating their needs, promoting student learning and development, promoting student achievement in English language arts and reading and in mathematics, and foundations and professional roles and responsibilities. Each domain has between two and five competencies nestled under it. Let's go ahead and take it from the top. We'll dip our toes in with the domain that makes up the smallest portion of the exam at 13%, but stick around because we're going to tackle the largest domain right after this. Domain one consists of two competencies. In simple terms, the first is all about the categories of disability and their effects. The second covers evaluation and assessment. Let's dig into the first, IDEA. IDEA stands for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. This legislation governs how special education is implemented in school. Get ready to hear this acronym a lot. So part of IDEA categorizes disabilities. There are 13 categories defined by IDEA. To receive special education services, a student must qualify under one of these 13 categories. You'll need to know the defining characteristics of the categories, as well as the impact on learning. Now let's talk about the second competency under Domain 1. The other part of this category is all about evaluation and assessment. Expect to see terms like formal, informal, formative, summative, criterion referenced, curriculum based, portfolio, percentile rank, and grade equivalent on your exam. Want a sneak peek at what some of these terms mean? Let's take a look at an actual 240 video you'll see when you subscribe. Now let's talk about the differences between formative and summative assessment. Formative assessments are assessments for learning. They are used to guide instruction, meaning they're administered to assess students' progress toward meeting a learning objective, so teachers can adjust instruction as needed. They help teachers answer the question, what do I teach next? Summative assessments are assessments of learning. Next, we'll dive into domain two. This is one of the biggies. It's worth one third of your score. Competencies three through seven fall under it. Let's get into the first one. Planning instruction, two simple words that carry so much weight for a teacher. But we're ready to carry that weight, right? Heck yeah! Thanks for the enthusiasm, Dean. Now I'm going to go over some amazing concrete concepts you should know. But to really get the confidence you deserve to pass the test, you need to get the 240 study guide. Now based on my experience, I have identified a few key concepts that are highly likely to appear on the test and give you a nice leg up. For domain two, competency three, the key word is collaboration. Now, as a special educator, you will collaborate a lot with general education teachers, administrators, parents, speech therapists, occupational therapists, the school nurse. It's like that six degrees of separation game with Kevin Bacon. Who? I don't think people know who Kevin Bacon is. Okay, that's enough from you guys. In fact, some form of the word collaborate comes up nine times throughout the exam standards. Now, remind me to talk some more about collaboration once we make it to competency 12, but for now, our focus is on collaboration and instruction. Be prepared to collaborate with general education teachers to plan instruction for students receiving special education services by knowing what they need to learn based on grade level standards. You'll contribute your expert knowledge on how to help students learn the content based on instructional strategies that support the student's needs. 
Also, a big part of collaborating to plan instruction is ensuring the student's IEPs are followed in all educational settings. An IEP is a student's individualized education program. All students receiving special education services have an IEP. So this is an essential term to know. Okay, ready to talk about the next competency? This one is all about assistive technology. Well, that sounds fancy, and it can be. But it can also be as simple as a pencil grip that helps students hold their pencils in a way that makes it easier to write. The most important thing to remember when answering questions about assistive technology, also referred to as AT for short, is that it should support both the student's special needs and what they're trying to do. For example, a device for playing audio recordings of reading material could benefit both a student with a visual impairment and one with a specific learning disability in reading, who is focusing on answering comprehension questions. The AT aligns with both the need and the task. That's the takeaway for this competency, but there's more to know. You could spend your time Googling tech levels of AT, AT for ADLs, the SET framework, categories of AT used for different needs and activities. I'd follow Laura's lead and get the guide. All right, let's keep working through domain two. The next competency is about promoting educational performance. No big deal, right? I, for, yeah, it could be a big deal. Okay, can you, I got this. Yeah, that's pretty much the most important part of a teacher's whole job. There's a lot to know about this, but let me help you out with a key concept, differentiation. As in, there's a differentiation between the person talking and the person recording. Anyway, back to differentiation in the classroom. Differentiation is beneficial to all learners, but it's especially important for those with special needs. Differentiation is all about meeting students where they are and providing what they need to help them progress. Remember this from earlier? You can use the same mode of thinking for answering questions about differentiation. Find the answer that best aligns with the student's needs and what they're working on. You may be distracted by other answers that look like great things to do for your students, but don't forget, differentiating should always support what students need to be successful and what they need to do. Let's move forward, shall we? Our next competency focuses on behavior and social skills. Let's discuss some key terms you should know for this portion of your exam. PBIS, FBA, and BIP. Half the battle of passing this test is knowing your acronyms. And if we were to turn that into an acronym, it would be Hatibapatikia? Anyway, PBIS stands for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. It is a proactive approach to promote positive behavior for all students. Sometimes students require extra support to promote positive behavior. This is where an FBA and a BIP may come in. An FBA is an evaluation focused on behavior that strives to determine what is causing the undesired behaviors. Students undergoing a special education evaluation, students with an IEP or 504 plan, and students in certain serious school discipline situations are eligible for an FBA. All behaviors have a purpose. Students act in certain ways for a reason. An FBA seeks to figure out what these reasons are. BIP is short for Behavior Intervention Plan. A BIP is a formal written plan to address and improve student behavior. It defines the undesired behavior, describes why it is occurring, and outlines a plan to use strategies and supports to help. So remember, an FBA determines why a behavior occurs, and a BIP is a plan created to improve the behavior. One competency left to go in this domain? Let's get to it. This competency covers transitioning students out of special education services and into the next phase of their lives. Because as much time and attention teachers pour into their students, it will eventually be time for them to leave the nest. As emotional as that may be, it's comforting to know that a plan must be established before a student receiving special education services leaves high school. In fact, in Texas, this planning starts when the student is 14. Like many components of special education, collaboration is key for transition planning. And it's required that the student be invited to participate in the process. Let's skip ahead to domain four. We'll continue to focus specifically on the special education material and then move into domain three, which covers language arts and math. Don't worry, I promise I won't forget. Domain four accounts for 20% of your test score. It includes three competencies, one on foundations, one on legal and ethical requirements, and one on collaboration. Let's get into foundations of special education first. You know how we've spent a lot of time talking about acronyms? Let's go ahead and cover two more. Do you remember how IDEA governs how school districts provide special education services to students? 
Well, there are six main components of this legislation. We've already discussed one of the most important need to knows, the IEP. But now, let's dig into FAPE and LRE. FAPE stands for Free Appropriate Public Education. The biggest takeaway here is that every student is entitled to, well, a free and appropriate public education, no matter the disability. Schools cannot deny services. It's against the law. LRE stands for Least Restrictive Environment. This means that, to the maximum extent possible, students with disabilities should be educated with their non-disabled peers. In simple terms, students receiving special education services should not be removed from the general education classroom, unless it's necessary for their learning, which is not up to an individual teacher to decide, but it must be determined by a committee based on evaluation and outlined in the student's IEP. Now that our minds are on the laws that govern special education, let's stay on that train of thought and discuss legal and ethical requirements. Here's a big one. Parents must give written consent before certain parts of the special education process can take place. Written consent is needed before an evaluation can begin, and also before special education services outlined on an IEP can initially be implemented. All right, let's get into the lighter part of this domain. I told you earlier that we'd circle back to collaboration, and here we are. Educating students with special needs is not a solo gig. When it comes to collaborating, special education teachers wear a lot of hats. Resource, advocate, communicator. These are some of the most important collaborative roles of a special education teacher. When answering questions from this competency, always go with what's in the best interest of the child, keeps the parents informed and involved, and of course, follows the law. All right, now on to the domain that covers English language arts and math. Domain three counts for one third of your test score. It consists of two competencies, one for ELA and one for math. That's simple enough. Let's start with ELA. A big portion of this competency covers foundational reading skills, such as phonological and phonemic awareness, the alphabetic principle, word analysis, and fluency. Reading comprehension is also addressed, as well as writing skills and visual media. Let's pick on two of these and tie them together. Fluent reading supports comprehension. It's easier to understand reading material when it's read with accuracy and prosody at an appropriate speed. Does reading fluently come easily to all students? Absolutely not. Is it important? Absolutely yes. The whole point of reading is making meaning of the text, and as we've established, reading fluently helps students to do so. So if students are struggling with fluency, there's a strategy for that. Actually, several different effective strategies. The right methods will depend on which component of fluency a student is struggling with, but in general, it's important to make sure that they're reading at their current level and that they have lots of opportunities to read out loud, especially repeated readings of the same text. Now that's just one key concept from this competency. If you're ready to brush up on all of this ELA content to make sure you're ready to nail this portion of your exam, we have it ready for you in the study guide. All right, now everyone's favorite, math. Hey, hey, enough with you guys. I've had it up to here. I'm gonna turn this video around. Well, even if math isn't your favorite, you'll still need to solve a few math problems on the test. But it's just a few, and you do get a calculator and a formula chart. You'll see more questions about how to teach math, so let's dive in there. Some questions will just have you pick the best action given the education goal. If you've taught anyone math before, this'll be easy. This means knowing when to use manipulatives, inquiry, exploratory play, real-world connections, and even technology and games. For example, manipulatives are great for introducing a concept or working through a misconception. There are also some questions on classic pedagogical concepts like backward design, just now applied to math. And if you need to brush up on any of this, it's all in the 240 guide. You might be asked how to intervene when a student is falling behind in math. Remember, all interventions should be specific to the student's needs, appropriate given the goals listed on the IEP, and selected based on the root of the issue. And those are the big things to know in math. That wasn't so bad, was it? Now that we've gone over some of the big concepts in our four domains, let's look at some practice questions to show you how these concepts can appear on the test. If you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test below. At the end, you get a score report on how well you did on the test. Did I mention the 240 study guide has a money back guarantee that you'll pass? Now for questions. Here's one where we need to be able to classify disabilities. This question is asking us to identify a trait of a student with a specific learning disability. 
the student demonstrates deficits in academic achievement when compared to cognitive abilities. This is an indicator of a specific learning disability, so this is the correct one. Remember how I told you Competency 2 was about evaluation and assessment? Let's look at one of the ways it is reflected in a question. Maxwell is a fifth grade student who has Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, also referred to as ADHD. During his annual IEP meeting, the special education teacher shares the results of Maxwell's most recent unit tests in the four core subjects. This data falls under which type of assessment? The choices are summative, formative, norm-referenced, and informal. A summative assessment evaluates student learning at the end of a unit of study. This is the best choice. Did you need to know the student had ADHD to answer this question? How about the setting being an IEP meeting? Nope. This question is purely about types of assessment. It's just put through the lens of a special education situation. Now, let's look at one about assistive technology. A student with fine motor coordination and writing difficulties who receives in-class support with the occupational therapist would benefit from what accommodation? Okay, let's think about our formula. The student needs fine motor support to help them write. The only choice that directly aligns with the need and the task is this one, the use of adaptive writing utensils. While the other choices might seem appealing, they require too much of a leap based on what we know from the question stem. Now let's take a look at a question from the behavior and social skills competency. A student has shown a significant increase in inappropriate behaviors. These behaviors continue to occur in structured and unstructured school settings. The teacher has not seen an improvement in behavior despite providing specially designed interventions. What should the IEP team consider next in order to support the student? It sounds like the student would benefit from a BIP, but an FBA should happen first. The function of the behavior, along with other important information, must be determined before a plan is made to improve it. Now for a question about special education foundations. Which of the following is a provision of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act? This is the correct answer, ensuring that students are provided with reasonable accommodations to access the curriculum. Section 504 is another essential piece of legislation to know for your special education exam. It comes up a lot, along with IDEA. And guess what? We have it covered in the study guide. Now let's see one from the ELA section. Every day as part of his class's morning routine, a special education teacher has his class clap out the syllables of the day of the week and the month of the year. He then says a simple sentence about the day's activities and prompts his students to tell him how many words are in the sentence. Last, he names an object in the classroom and asks his students to identify the first sound, then share more words that start with the same sound. What type of skills is this teacher trying to promote through all these activities? All of these activities have to do with sounds. Hearing the words that make up a sentence, the syllables that make up a word, and specific sounds in words are all examples of phonological awareness skills. And finally, let's look at a math question. Okay, we're given a situation with a struggling first grade student. She keeps adding, even if the problem calls for subtraction. The teacher has tried having the student circle the symbol first, but it's not working. What should the teacher do next? It seems like Mia has a conceptual misunderstanding of what subtraction is. This is the best choice. Univix cubes will help provide Mia with a more concrete understanding of the processes of addition and subtraction and the difference between the two operations. Congratulations on finishing the video. Even you, other guys in the studio. Heck yeah. If you found it helpful, give it a like. There's still plenty more to learn. Our Texas 161 study guide has 182 practice questions, just like the ones we walked through just now. So if you really wanna make sure you're prepared for the Texas Special Education EC through 12 exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 study guide. So click the link below right now to get started.